gospel reading today is from the 21st chapter of Luke. There will be signs in the sun, the moon and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is coming near. Then he told them a parable. Jesus told this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life, and that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. I started my research for today's sermon inadvertently by wandering through the Christmas department at Target some weeks ago. I don't need anything for the holidays. Nothing at all except maybe some new wrapping paper. Otherwise, I have enough, far more than enough, of decorations and gift boxes and lights and candles. But it's fun, isn't it, to see all that's laid out for us? It all sparkles and glistens and invites us to touch and examine and, yes, to purchase. And if we are warm and comfortable, we might come to believe in those department store aisles that Christmas is all about shininess and trinkets and themed trees and the sweetness of a newborn baby surrounded by exceptionally clean and fluffy sheep. But no. That's not what we get on this first Sunday of Advent. Advent is the season of preparation for Christmas. The word Advent comes from the Latin for arrival. It's a time in which we expect reassurance, hope, possibility, peace. And yet what we get in this first Sunday's gospel are apocalyptic signs, wild, even frightening signs, Depictions of chaos and confusion, of roaring seas and shaking heavens. Signs of the second coming of Christ, of the parousia, the Greek word for Advent. How are these signs, which seem so startling and even violent, how do these signs relate to the nativity, to the first coming of Christ? These readings surprise us every year. While radio stations are playing holly jolly Christmas, the final chapters of the Gospels tell us that the end of the world as we know it is coming. We want to be comforted by the arrival of tiny Jesus in a simple bedding of straw, but the scriptures nudge us toward profound discomfort. We are not, of course, unaware of the potential for disaster. No era has been without its crises. Today, this day, right now, we might hear someone say with respect to wars in the Mideast, or famine in the Horn of Africa, or threats from well-armed nations, or the pandemic, or floods or fires right here at home. We might hear someone say, there's never been anything like this. After all, how often in the past two years have we heard newscasters use the word unprecedented? Look at us. The pandemic has left us disoriented and depleted. 
the race, the race charged court trials of the past weeks in, in our country have brought our national divisions into sharp relief. The congressional debates over spending and financial relief have angered and frustrated us. And in our own personal lives, loved ones die and we get sick and finances collapse and solutions seem impossible to discover. And yet, it isn't really unprecedented, is it? It happens in every era. So what does today's gospel reading the one we had expected to give us fodder for a Christmas pageant. What does it have to say to us? Where is baby Jesus hidden in the turmoil of the seas? Where is King Jesus to be found in the trauma of our lives? What does this reading say to us? Let me tell you this. It does not mention anything about shopping or baking or decorating trees. All excellent activities, don't get me wrong, but they are not for today. It also does not tell us to be timid or frightened or hopeless. It does not tell us to run away. In today's gospel reading, we are commanded to be people of boldness and strength. We are invited to prepare for Christmas by becoming attentive to both both terrifying and mundane signs. And as is so often the case in scripture, in order to grasp the message, we need to do a little work. We need to understand the world in time before this text, the world of this text, and the world in the future beyond this text. Let's start with the world before the text and a bit of Bible study. By the time the Gospel of Luke was actually written down, the temple in Jerusalem, the center of Jewish life and prayer and celebration and sacrifice, it had been destroyed by the Romans in a terrible battle. Luke's listeners and readers had already survived that cataclysmic event, one which continues to this day to loom large in the lives and hearts of the Jewish people. Just like us, we look at history as we endure a great pandemic. So Luke's audience knew what disaster was and they knew signs of what might come. Jesus, in the present of his life and of the gospel story, spoke to his followers about the future. But Luke wrote decades later about the future as the Jerusalem world understood it in the years immediately after it happened. A little confusing, but it can help us to know that when Jesus spoke about his return and about the signs that would signal his coming, he was talking about the distant, unknown future. But when Luke finally wrote Jesus' words down, he knew that his folks had an event in the immediate past by which to understand it. It's kind of as if someone today wrote a prediction of destruction made by a person living in London in 1938. The writer today and the speaker of 1938 might be thinking of something far, far in the future, but a London audience of today would immediately think that they were talking about the blitz of World War II. So often we too, try to make present, sense of present and future by placing them into a past context. So what about the future? The coming of Jesus for the second time, echoing the coming of Jesus for the first time. Jesus in Luke tells us of terrifying times, sun, moon, stars, earth, all undergoing crisis event. Think eclipses, meteors, earthquakes, volcanoes, tsunamis, climate change. You've noticed that he has talked about distress caused by the roaring of the seas and the waves. To ancient Jews, the sea symbolized chaos, something to be feared. And yet it seems that somewhere in all of this mayhem and tumult and turmoil, God is present because Jesus is coming 
Jesus comes in the midst of the storms of nature. And Jesus comes also in the midst of the storms of human society. Now here's an intriguing matter. But you have to pay attention to the Greek in which this text was written to, uh, in order to understand it. I know that's what you all came for today, right? A lesson in Greek. So here goes. More Bible study. Although the passage refers to cosmic events, events of the skies and the universe, the Greek word cosmos is not used. But two other words are. First, three times we see the word earth which is a translation of the Greek word geis. So the earth itself, the ground, the soil from which plants grow, the mud from which humans were formed, the home to the ocean and seas, the geis, the earth, is also home to these events. But then the Bible tells us people will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world. And the Greek for world is not geis, but rather oikumene. Oikumene means the inhabited world, the world of human social and economic and political affairs, the world of human concerns. God and Jesus are engaged not only in the world of natural events, but in the world of human affairs as well. And the world of human affairs, it's metaphorically also the world of tossing seas. Our politics, our community lives, even if we never go near the water, we often feel as if we are being tossed by waves, don't we? In the world of human events, Jesus is going to die. And in the present of today's gospel, because we are reading from something almost at the end of Luke, Jesus is about to die because of human political injustice and criminality. Is God more achingly present to humanity than in the presence of God's Son dying on a cross? That is a crucial reminder on this first Sunday of Advent. But Jesus is going to rise from the earth, from the gaze, from a tomb, and from human divisiveness, from the oikumene. And is God more joyously present than in that rising, in that overcoming, in that triumph, which begins in a manger made of straw, a product of the earth, among the human family, the inhabitants of the world. This is a lot to take in. End times, heavens, earth, moon, stars, tides, human strife, and God breaking into all of it. And Jesus, the great teacher, provides a parable to ease the way. He reminds us that we know that when fig trees, all trees, sprout leaves, summer is near. Fig trees, bulbs, seedlings, these are all signs with which we are familiar. Perhaps, in fact, we take them so for granted that we fail to recognize them for the profound cosmic events that even they are. After all, what makes the growth of a seedling into a forest possible? Sun and water, photosynthesis, a process that also in its oxygen byproduct, makes our breathing and living possible. That's not a little thing, no matter how familiar it seems. It's a process with which we are familiar, even if we can't explain it. But it's a huge thing, and it tells us something is coming. Something is ending when a fig tree sprouts the world of winter and snow and cold. And something is coming, something good, sunshine, warmth, growth. In this simple parable, devoid of crashing seas and roaring waves, but filled with the miracle of nature, Jesus tells us again, the reign of God is near. So 
this first Sunday of Advent, it's not about a sweet manger scene, cooperative animals, a shining star, a troop of visitors from near and far, some of them rush, rough and impoverished, others regal and wealthy. That will all come. They will all come. But this first Sunday, it's about how huge it all is. Even the fig tree parable is a gentle bridge to hugeness. Huge universe, huge power, huge love in the center of it all. Yes, desperate as it all sounds, as terrifying and destructive as it seems to be, God is in it all and Jesus is coming. And this first Sunday is about how we are to respond. I have a project for you for the week ahead, a spiritual practice for Advent. It's actually a project for the entire four weeks it comes in three parts, and it includes no Greek, okay? So you can do this. First, I want you to read today's gospel. Don't worry if it only takes you a minute or two. You can go back and do it again every day if you want. I've probably read it a hundred times over the past couple of weeks, and not just in English or in one translation, and that wasn't enough. So feel free to proceed with do-overs. Read that gospel. Second, give particular attention to verses 28, 34, and 36. You can write them down if you want to, but you don't have to. You'll see what I mean as soon as you start reading. Because these verses are full of verbs in the form of commands. Those commands are stand up, raise your heads, be on guard, be alert, pray for strength. And you might even add verse 29, which tells us to look at that fig tree. There are other verbs as well, but these are the ones we're focusing on. And they boil down to be vigilant and be bold. Despite the enormity of the signs telling us that God is active in both creation and in the realm of human affairs, Advent is not a time to cower in fear. It's a time to rise up against injustice, against the aches of this world, and against our own sorrows. Advent is not a time to look down. It's a time to raise our heads and our eyes and look at the real in front of us. Advent is not a time to be careless or indifferent to our faith, to other people, to God's creation, the gays, or to human affairs, the oikumeni. Advent is a time to be vigilant, alert, attentive, and to see. Advent is not a time to be lax or to hide out. Advent is a time to pray for strength, which means, my friends, to pray to be bold and to act. That makes Advent a time of challenge. And so here is the third part of your Advent practice. After you've read this text, after you've looked at those verbs, choose one of those commanding verbs and do what it says. Stand up. Raise your head, be vigilant, pray, and be strong. Look at what your household or your extended family or your local world or your congregation or the big, wide, and wild earth or the big, wide, and wild human family. Look at what they need, what they cry out for, what they say to you, and be the person Jesus is calling you to be. Jesus is coming, dear church. He is coming in the very body of a fearless and undaunted young woman. He is coming across the waves. He is coming through the clouds. Stand up and be strong. Amen.
Thanks for watching our video. Make sure to subscribe to get the latest and greatest videos from the Old Stone Church. And if you feel blessed by our message, please go to the oldstonechurch.org and click to donate. God bless you today and forever. The Old Stone Church. We've been loving Christ and serving city since 1820.